Hello everyone and welcome to the 3 Pound Dev Stream. My name is Mike Johnson, I'm Community Manager for 3 Pound Games. And this is week two of our Blender tutorial. Starring Bryce Evans with attentive students Cordelia and Alyssa. I've unmuted the three of them now. We are back. Hello. Want to just recap Bryce very quickly what we went over last week and what we're going to do today. And then I'll get out of the way. So I was asking okay. you to do that, my bad. Yes, yes. <laughs> Uh, so last week we went over uh, basic navigation of Blender because if you haven't used it before, it's somewhat strange. It's definitely less strange than it used to be, um, but still uh, takes a little getting used to uh, and you can find yourself in some dead ends if you're not sure. So uh, we did that and then we started to get into some modeling uh, hotkeys and stuff like that. Um, but that's what we're really going to start diving into today. Um, as well as this whole hey, section over here that we never looked at. Okay, we were talking. Off, we were talking off camera just before we got started about um, like modeling Blender to match something you're already used to, just so there's some familiarity to it as you go through it. No, today and Alyssa were talking about that. Yeah, uh, hotkey. like hotkey navigation and right. stuff like that. So um, the the middle mouse to orbit can kind of screw you up if you're bouncing like from unity where middle mouse like middle mouse pans uh and like right click looks around whereas mm -hmm. in blender right click is just menus uh and and middle mouse is orbit not look uh the difference being like this is rotating around the object you're looking at whereas like a look would be like moving the camera like I can't even really do it. <laughs> um, Relative to your pivot versus the yeah. you're looking at. Yeah. Relative to the origin of the camera versus the origin of the target, I guess you could say. All right. Uh, quick promotion note, and then I'm going to get out of the way. Uh, this series will conclude next week. Next week will be the last Blender tutorial. We may return to this down the line because uh, Bryce said he could do a year on Blender easily and not run out of stuff to talk about. Um, but the two weeks after that, so starting on February 9th and the February 16th, we'll be talking about the new Space Dragon Unchained update that's coming soon. Uh, Bryce and Cordelia are working very, very hard on that to put out some new content. I've seen some of the screenshots. I'm very excited. Yeah. And then for the next couple of Mondays, we'll be playing the new Walkabout Mini Golf Course on uh, because they just released Atlantis today. So we'll be checking out the front nine of that this coming Monday and the back nine next Monday. All right. I'm done promoting. Bryce, the floor is yours. Okay. I'm going to put some dragons in chat. Okay, so <laughs> we are on the precipice of all of the modeling uh, and scene and material and UV greatness. So we should just dive right into it. First of all, I guess, um, did any of y'all uh, have any questions in your intense study since last week of blender uh, and playing around and all that was did anything pop up for y'all that was like uh oh a little um, bit um <laughs> during objects and then remerging them to the but we can i'm i think because i found a modifier which is part of that little menu that we haven't gotten to yet that can help with that but i didn't know if there's a uh -huh in the edit direct mode directly a good way of doing that and having it all in one fell swoop of like mirror and remerge kind of thing yes cool so um let's i'm gonna start with a cube again classic um so yeah one of the first things um that assist greatly in modeling in anything uh is modifiers course um we'll we'll kind of cut to those first um because there's some good differentiators in there about uh object and edit mode um which we talked about briefly before but um we can do again and then we'll kind of go through like the whole stack and make stuff look real purdy what's scary so, sorry what's scary robin all the dragons <laughs> not the cool swivelly head dragon that thing's amazing <laughs> I like that. I like that one. <laughs> Why can't I get out of object mode? Uh, merging, merging objects. Okay. 
Oh, merging objects. Oh, it'll be it'll be very fun. Uh, tab uh, is to go between object and edit mode. I don't know if that. Oh, like helps. that's helpful. <laughs> yeah. That's like not. Uh... Tab's great. I feel like she really wanted to say that would have been helpful last week. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. My drop down no. is uh, only showing object mode as an option. Oh. Uh, share your screen real right, right. Oh, yeah, I'm not sharing my screen. And Mike, sometimes you have to find the you have to try something enough to find the appreciation for a useful uh, key <laughs> before you get it. True. All right, I'm looking uh, at that list of screen now. If y'all want to talk through this, Discord is not helping with its bit rate. No, That's for real. Cool. Holy crap! Uh, my internet's crap. also bad, so there's that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh wait, I forgot. Um. Jake is downloading something on his Xbox. I can pause it. Hold on. I would just restart Blender. <laughs> I would okay. just unplug the Xbox. Just like, you don't need this game right now. Yeah. Just because I can't. Yeah, he's just downloading games while he's at work, but I can just pause it really quick. It also looks like you don't have a mesh selected. It looks like you have something else. Do you have like the light selected <laughs> on it? Probably it. I forgot. Oh, right. Because okay. you have, like edit mode has is really relating to that one specific object. Yeah. Yeah, so if you have the light selected, you'll see that object mode is the only thing you can select. Oh, gotcha. So that could be it. Yeah, yeah that's a funny thing. Is, is there a way to, like, multi like be editing multiple objects at the same time, too, or do they have to be merged to do that? Uh, yeah, no, so, like, if I have two separate objects like this, I can shift select both and then tab in and edit both. I see. Okay. I was in this move this guy around mode, which I don't know how to reset this. Little when the window on the right or the little pop out thing wasn't it the little but the little circle yeah. target thing that... oh you're moving yeah that I'm, moving I'm to... selected in this sorry i'm hopping back and forth people on this screen this is Alyssa's yeah. screen right now this is Alyssa's, not bryce sorry uh so yeah if you if you hold shift and right click it moves your 3d cursor around um to reset that if you hit uh n on the keyboard uh you can go over to view uh and 3d cursor is there and you can just set all this back to zero 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 zero, zero oh, okay. all the way down be nice if they had a reset button there. Okay. Nice. there may be there may be like a shortcut you could make that like hard reset so like um i think you can set origin and you can set like 3d cursor mm -hmm. that 3d cursor not nah, just origin the 3d cursor but um th there may be a way to do that so uh modifiers modifiers are great um, especially as an example of stuff uh, that we can do to make things easier. So uh, we'll cover like the the hierarchy and the the um, outliner and the panels and stuff over here. But um, the the biggest one or one of the biggest ones uh, is this little wrench, uh, which is the modifier um, tab. So there are a few like classics like array, boolean, mask, mirror, um, solidify is a good one, subdivision surface is nice, um, weighted normals are good when we start to get into like subdivision stuff, smooth surfaces or hard surface. Um, and then there's a bunch of like deformation stuff that you can do too for um, like retopology and stuff is, it's pretty useful over there. So uh, if we just start with a mirror modifier, classic, there are some things to know when starting to mirror something. So um, I'm just going to prep this cube. So I'm going to delete the modifier just by clicking the little X here. Uh, and I'm just going to go into let's go into front mode and I'm going to tab into edit mode and I'm going to make a loop cut down the center so I can cut this in half. Uh, and if we remember, that's control R. So I control R and then I can mouse over whichever direction I want to cut. And then I left click to cut and then I can left click again to commit or I can right click to just stay centered between the two verts that I cut between so if I do that then I can select the verts on one side just so that I can delete these now remember the horror that is about to be shown here I have drag selected these if I were to delete these vertices, I would have a problem because boom, 
didn't select the verts behind because we don't have x-ray mode on. So if we remember in the upper right, this little two squares button here is our x-ray mode. And if we wanted this to be a little bit less transparent, we could click the drop down for our render modes and increase the x-ray back to one, which is usually what I do. So that's usually the order I do things. I'll start a new new file. I'll create a cube. I'll cut it in preparation for a mirror. I'll drag select, delete the verts, realize I don't have transparent mode on. I'll turn that on and then I'll set x-ray to one. So now if I drag select, it selects everything, which is great. Now we haven't talked about um, deleting stuff yet, deleting sub-object stuff. Um, so that's just X uh, on the keyboard. It, when you click X on the keyboard, it'll give you a bunch of different options. So if I wanted to delete these vertices, I could do that and you can see it deletes those. If I wanted to delete the edges, you can see it just deletes the edges, but it doesn't delete the verts. So those are still there. And if I delete the faces, you can see the face is gone but everything else is still preserved. What's nice about this uh, is you can also dissolve, which I believe is the same as control delete in Maya, I think. So an example of a dissolve would be if I made this cut down the center and I was like, oh darn, I don't want this cut here anymore. I could select the edge loop, which as we remember is alt left click to select the loop. And instead of deleting like the vertices and then remerging and bridging and all that stuff, I can just hit X and I can say dissolve edges. And that dissolves the edges and cleans up the verts and makes it so that it's back to being one uncut object again. So those are handy. Um, deleting specific things or dissolving specific things uh, is usually pretty great. If we wanted to, as an example, just straight up delete the vertices, then we could bridge this back. One of the hotkeys for that, if I switch to edge mode and just select these two edges by clicking and holding shift, uh, you can hit F, which is fill, or um, I think I have B or control B uh, hotkeyed as bridge. Right now it's beveling actually, so that must not be on this machine. Um, but you can also um, bridge edge loops. The major difference, I believe, is that if I were to select multiple and fill, um, it does a weird thing where it's it hasn't actually filled e it hasn't bridged each edge. It has filled one polygon, so it's now it's now an end gone. It's a six sided thing. Whereas I think if I bridge, yeah, so that's the difference. So fill will just fill the whole polygon with one face, but bridge will actually try and connect the different edge loops. I have a question. Shocking. Yes. Compared to other programs you have used, would you say it's easier or harder to recover from a catastrophic mistake in Blender? Oh my gosh. <laughs> what a good looking question. It's the best. The only, it's the the biggest, most forgiving thing, and, and one of the biggest, I think, selling points of Blender is just how forgiving it is. Um, especially when we start talking about rigging and animating. Um, it Coming from Maya and a lot of Maya folk, when I tell them that you can have a fully rigged and animated model and go back in and add bones and not have to weight paint anything like blows people's minds because it's like that's impossible mm. like you shouldn't be able to do that and it's like hey, yes you can though can you can, can you edit vertices too like yes. add vertices and things holy crap yes. <laughs> you, you could add like uh, the amount of times that i've been like uh, i've like modeled something and i'm like oh, i need like more geometry for this like section so that it can stretch and stuff and i just go in edit more geometry add it in and then i'm like oh man a helper bone would be great and then add a helper bone yeah oh wow you can add geo and it will automatically weight the new verts based on the verts around it whoa like that had weight already so like if if yeah. it was like weighted one to one bone one to the other and you split that in half it would weight the middle thing you just split 
to 0.5 and 0.5 in either direction. What about, um, uh, what was it? Uh, crap, did I just completely forget what I was going to ask? I think I did. It'll come back up. <laughs> okay, no worries. Um, but that's, so that's one of the biggest things, Mike, um, uh, is when you learn, the biggest thing for me learning ZBrush was learning how to fix mistakes. Because the amount of times in ZBrush that I felt that I did something irreparable um, was like every other minute. Um, so once I had focused in ZBrush on learning how to fix stuff um, in a non-mathematical way, like a lot of times in ZBrush, it's like, oh, I did something. And it's like, well, you can just like smooth it out. And I'm like, no, I want to put it back to what it was before. Uh, and then a lot of people were just like, yeah, but why though? Because like <laughs> ZBrush is about visuals. It's not about like having perfectly spaced vertices and things like that. So it's like, don't worry about it. So once I kind of got through that, it was it was very helpful. So the same thing with with Blender, and um, that's why I'm trying to we're, we're trying to go through this in like the most like here's what might go wrong and how do we fix it kind of way, um, because nothing is worse than than thinking you have broken something. Uh, and not being able to fix it. So um, Blender is, is, like I said, extremely forgiving in that regard. Very, very um, flexible when it comes to that stuff. So totally. Oh, yeah, so that I remembered my question is freeze transforms. Yeah. If you forget to freeze your transforms before skinning, is there a way to fix that? <laughs> yes, and that's actually something yeah. that we're going to, like, one of the reasons why I want to do the mirror modifier first is because that's one of the big things um, that can mess you up with with the mirror modifier and with with UVs actually is um, a, in in Blender it's applying transforms. Um, so yes. Okay. Um, but yeah, so let's say I have my cube and I have split it down the middle and I have deleted half of it so that we may mirror it. So with this half, if I add a modifier now you can add modifiers now in edit mode but before it didn't let you um, because you needed to be in object mode to add the modifier so that it knew what it was doing before you went back to sub object mode or edit mode um, but now it doesn't matter so um, if I go back and add my mirror modifier we can see now that it is mirrored and if I grab chunks of vertices you can see that it is working now this is a very important distinction to make here. I was in edit mode when I was moving this stuff around. If I am in object mode, you can see that mm. it would look like the mirror is not working. So I've seen this happen before where someone will have their cube, they'll add a mirror modifier, and they'll start to move it around or scale it, uh, and they'll be like, it's not mirrored, it's broken. The reason this is, is because if we look, when we move this cube, you can see there's an orange dot in the center. That's its origin. So a lot of modifiers and a lot of systems in Blender um, are symmetry and things like that are based on the origin of the object. So this mirror modifier is mirroring along the x-axis in relation to the origin of the object itself. So by moving the object, I'm moving its origin. So because I'm moving the origin, the mirror modifier is like, well, yeah, I'm still perfectly symmetrical across the x-axis because nothing has moved in that way. Whereas in edit mode, you can see if I move these, obviously, even if I move everything, you can see the orange dot doesn't move because I'm not moving the actual object, I'm moving the sub-objects. So that's an important distinction to make. Now, you can, like, move this object and then we could, like, set its origin back to the 3D cursor, which is the center, and now you can see it's mirrored again. But I don't recommend doing that. I recommend just moving in sub-object mode. So quickly say hello to Steve, who's answered the chat. Steve, Steve! Hope you're doing well. Hello. Steve, it always seems that we talk about Blender the night before a Blender stream. I don't know if that's some kind of <laughs> thing we do, but last week and this week, we both... Uh, <laughs> Steve and I were, were both in Blender until the wee hours of the night. Messing with stuff for fun. Actually talking about UVs, which we're talking about today. Someday I'll be able to play with Blender all night long without <laughs> without being angry and frustrated. Speaking of which, I have a question. Yes. Um, 
let's say I modified and I put a bevel or whatever. How do I apply that modifier so I can edit like vertices after I've, I've done with the bevel? The evidence so you did. Uh, so I did like square into a sphere, and I want to like okay. merge the vertices and edit the vertices now. Yeah, like that, because it still has like the original square like around it. If I go to mess with the vertices, it just lets me play with these and not. Right. Yes. <laughs> so Whoa. what you want is okay. you want to uh, apply this. So there's a little drop down next to the modifier, which we're going to get to in a second. Okay. okay but I'll okay. jump ahead. Uh, you want to apply. The reason I can't apply right now is because I'm in edit mode. If I tab okay. back to object mode, I can apply that. And now I have geo. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm hopping back and forth helps. between your Thank screens. You. <laughs> Bunch of bunch of line cutters over here I jumping know, ahead in the old queue here. That's standard me in class. So <laughs> you're oh, right. is, no worries. You gotta be curious to get into this stuff. Absolutely yeah, not. I find <laughs> something that piques my interest and then I run with it and then I get stuck on something that we haven't covered yet. <laughs> uh -huh. No, that's how it goes. <laughs> totally, <laughs> totally. Um, I do have a question that is relative to something you were just saying, if you want to yeah. move the pivot, but not specifically to the origin, but just like kind of like, is there a gizmo to adjust the pivot position or the or the origin position? Is gizmo I a have... technical term? Yes. Yeah. Okay. It That's is actually... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Both in Unity and in, well, pretty oh, much yeah. all yeah, it's, it's the Unity. little, it's the little three, it's the, well, it's a visual for like whatever tool you're using is usually called a gizmo. Yeah, if it's like um, a move tool, it's like the thing you grab onto, yeah. like you see the arrows and you can like interact with it. I'm just thinking about gremlins right now. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I love Gizmo. Um, the only, the only method that I have used to adjust the pivot that specifically um, has been moving the 3D cursor. But does that apply? Because so like in object mode, it basically behaves like you're in unity like hierarchy mode it looks like and so i'm wondering like like say i mean for an example you you are working on something and you realize you've kind of gotten shifted off of the pivot is there a way to like recenter it center around the center to object or just generally like change that position directly i'm stepping away for like two seconds i hear my dog messing with something you should be messing with be right back uh -oh. <laughs> So yeah, so what you can do, like the the quickest way, I suppose, would be like, well, let's say that you did this, right, and and moved this like way over here. Mm -hmm. um, you can, if you just hit spacebar, if your spacebar is search, um, and just type set origin, you can set origin to geometry, and it will center it back to the center of the mass of what you have. Mm -hmm. Um, but what you can also do to kind of manually set the pivot is you can move your object to where you want the pivot to be in relation to 3D cursor, and then mm -hmm. you can set origin to 3D cursor, and now oh. my object's pivoting around that. So the, you can, yeah, just use the cursor as a go-between. Okay. Basically, yeah. E e if it's convenient to move the cursor itself with shift right click, or if it's more convenient to move the object in yeah. relation to the cursor those are the quickest ways i've seen i don't know if there's a way to like directly move the pivot itself with a gizmo um but there may be like an add-on um like like insert in maya i guess i'm thinking or or whatever control d or insert i think it is um so and the cursor i guess is that also is there a way to set a move gizmo on the cursor or does it always have to be done with that very i guess you could snap but like the right the quick command for it it's hard to get exact positioning yes i have never moved the cursor in that way okay um i don't know if it's not super specific like like uh, the stuff that i've been doing is not like specific enough to warrant that or if there's always just been some like blenderish workaround that i've used um but I, yeah i can't think of a time that i've done that so i don't know I guess, and it looks like, in, I guess, in theory, you can move the object around the pivot rather than trying to move the pivot. <laughs> so yeah, and then you can always, like, yeah, you can always move the object around it. It's kind of a different yeah. mental approach that way. Mm -hmm. 
but um and that I, that's what i'm trying to think is like is is the reason i've never done that because i tried to once and then they were like you can't and so i was like cool guess i won't <laughs> uh, i was watching the stream and just saw a browser window pop up my apologies <laughs> fine mike i get it i think we'll recover <laughs> <laughs> all right so we have this mirror modifier so uh if i were to move like the center out a little bit so there's this gap we can see what some of the modifier elements will do so first off we can rename the modifier if we want to i never do um next to the modifier name we have some properties here uh in order uh, we have this, it's called on cage. Um, I just call this like show me stuff. Um, whenever this is toggled on, it, it essentially, it, it's like it enables editing of the result ahead of the result actually being committed. So you can see when I, when I toggle this on for the mirror modifier, you can see that I can now select on either side as opposed to just the actual live geometry because technically the mirrored thing isn't actual geo because the modifier is what's applying it but when you click this it it lets you it pretends that it is um subdivision has a similar thing so if i click this for the subdivision modifier you can see that instead of showing me the actual unsubdivided geo it's allowing me to click as if this was actually an applied modifier um so that's nice the next one over uh edit mode um this just simply uh shows like the result of of what you're gonna get uh while you're in edit mode so if this was off in edit mode i wouldn't see those changes but when i tab out the changes come back so i'll do the same thing again subdivision surface if i turn this off in edit mode when I'm editing, it's not subdivided, but when I'm in object mode, it's back to subdivided. Then we have the actual just, is it on or not? So with this off, whether I'm in object mode or edit mode, it's just off. So this is a great way to just like hide it if you don't want to see it for a while, or if you need more performance overhead, you can just turn this off. Uh, and then render is whether it's going to be used in the render. So you can have this off and and edit and do all this kind of stuff and and not have to see duplicates but if i were to render right now if i just go render render image oh i don't have a camera stand by camera so now if i go to render image you can see there well it's kind of hard to see but there's two it's still mirrored here in the render so the render is mirrored but the actual uh editor is not showing that so that's what those buttons do. Usually they default like this. This is usually what I leave them on. Sometimes I toggle this, this last one on if it just makes it more convenient for editing, but that's that. And then we have the actual contents of the modifier. So in this case, the mirror modifier has an axis, uh, axis a bisect, and a flip. So if I wanted to mirror across the Y axis instead of the X axis, then I could difficult to see uh, because they're overlapping right now. There we go. If I want to do multiple axes, you can uh, just by clicking more than one. So right now, both my X and my Y are mirrored. So if I were to grab the back half of these and move them, we could see now that I have four corners that I can move around. And I could do Z as well. And I could put this all in the upper half here. And now I have these four that I can do stuff with and rotate and scale, all kind of fun stuff. <clears throat> if I turn on bisect, um, then these things will start to kind of. Yeah, it's kind of difficult to see. You can see that it'll only uh, it'll only have geo where the mirror modifiers like touch each other. So like I'm bisecting in the Y right now. So if I'm not past the Y threshold, then nothing will happen. But as soon as I pass the Y threshold, then we see stuff. I usually don't use bisect. 
and then flip is you know in case if if our geo is like on the other side then we could flip on the x-axis or whatever and it would be flipped but in in my case it's not really set up like that steve says mirroring in the three axes and rotating them around looks like some fun 3d dig digitization uh vfx that oh yeah yeah Shiba. yeah it's very uh like um yeah old school like video effect kind of deal with with a bunch of mirroring and flipping um what's nice too is you can also um you can have a mirror object which i will show now so right now like we talked about we're mirroring along this object's origin here so uh, if we wanted to change the point that it was mirroring, we could move the verts in sub-object mode. We could go out to object mode, move this, and reset the origin back like we did. We could also just create a different object, and that is the object that it uses for the center point. So I'll just show that real quick. If I hit Shift-A um, to create something, or to add, um, I can just add an empty. I'm just going to add like an empty single arrow. There it is. Um, and I'm going to set this single arrow as the mirror object. So I can click on this and I can eyedropper the empty. And now this empty is the mirror object. So if I move this, you can see now it's using that as the center point to mirror along. So if I turn on X, Y, and Z, I can now move this object around. And it is now acting as the center transform for where this should be mirroring across. which offers a bit more flexibility when it comes to editing the verts themselves. You just have to worry about focusing on this object for your mirror and then everything else can just be modeled as normal. That's a clip right there. Everything you just did. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, Steve says that's dope. It is. I like it. Uh, and then the uh, last thing is this clipping and merge. So uh, right now it's not set to clipping. So that means if I grab the center, I can blend over into itself. If I turn clipping on, it will stop at the center and it will merge up to this threshold. So now if I were to grab a single vertex, I actually can't move this back apart because clipping is on. So these verts have merged if i want to move these away from the center i can turn clipping back off they're still live so they're they're not it's not like we have to split them back again um this clipping is kind of a, a live toggle so now if i need to move this vert i can move it forward backward up and down but i can't move it left or right because it has merged So that's the mirror modifier, one of one of many modifiers. Another one that's good to look at real quick is the subdivision surface modifier, another classic. So if I turn that on, we'll expose some flaws. That looks like a Lissa Scoop cube from earlier. Yeah. Yeah. All beveled and stuff. So same thing with this. It's got a name. We can rename if we want. Uh, we have our like um, kind of uh, fake commit this. If this is off, we can edit like normal uh, what the actual geometry looks like. And with this on, it's more like we're actually editing as if this was a committed modifier. I usually leave it like this because I like to see the cage um, because I like to keep a nice looking low poly uh, as well. Um, but that's just me. Catmull Clark is the algorithm that it uses. Um, simple is just like it's just adding uh, geometry without actually like smoothing anything, like not rounding it out. So almost always use this. Levels in the viewport and levels in the render are separate. So viewport is for display in the viewport, obviously, and then renders are for the renders. So you could 
uh, crank the render up to like five or six, um, but leave the viewport one fairly low so that when you actually render, um, it's super smooth, but you don't have to put up with the performance overhead while you're actually editing the object. So um, it's nice. And then this is showing us that our object is faceted, which is sometimes gross. So super easy way to fix this. If you're in object mode, uh, you can just right click shade smooth uh, and it does. And now it looks more like a traditional subdivision object. <laughs> nice and smooth. And then we can do stuff to it. Like move it around and edit and all that fun stuff. Raman says that's a nice looking low poly. It was some good low poly. There's some low poly there. Uh, some quick hard surface stuff if we want while we're in the subdivision modifier here. So I have my levels in the viewport to two. Um, if we want to make a surface sharp, I'm gonna select these two verts. We can just hit Shift E and drag. And you can see that this edge changes color. It's like pink now. Um, this is now a sharp edge. If you want to do this more like straight up, um, you can just um, hit Control E to pull up our edge menu. And we can just go to uh, Edge Crease and pull. Same thing. You can also mark this as sharp, but um, that's not really the same thing. So if I were to grab like this whole face, shift E, drag it, you can see now that the face is flat. Or not flat, but like heart surface. If you want to put it back, instead of uh, when you hit shift E, instead of pulling outward, if you go towards the center, it puts it back. Or um, you can hit like negative one and that'll completely get rid of it. So if I like wanted to get rid of the sharpness of this edge, I could select these two verts, shift E, negative one, and now it's back to normal. And we can kind of, what's nice about this is you can kind of uh, dictate a little bit softer of a, of an edge kind of in, in a nice manual way without uh, having to worry about like a hard number or something like that. And then of course there's the classic adding an edge loop. So if I really wanted to have control over this, you know, I could come to the bottom here and I could just control R, click, drag this down. And now I have a nice sharp surface and I could do that on this side as well. And then I could do that on this side as well. And now I have these nice creases there. Could go the other way with it as well. Could uh, bevel. So I could grab these and I could control B to bevel them. Now in doing this bevel, we see I have created an end gone. So that's when we can learn our next new tool, the knife tool. So if I were to control R, you can see I can no longer make a loop because we have an end gone here. So anytime I do a bevel or anytime I create an end gone like this, especially if it's a smooth object, what I like to do is I'll still use control R to get a general um, like loop going, not, so not obviously that kind of knife, Robin. Says, yes, well, <laughs> kind of. <laughs> so I'll go here and I'll Control R to create an edge loop. Uh, I'll go into front mode actually, so that I can slide this to kind of line up with the other one. So see now we have this nice line. And if I hit K for knife, 
Then I get a little knife icon. And the knife icon will highlight a vertex or an edge that I can cut along. So if I highlight this vertex and click, left click, you can see now I've started the cut. Then I can highlight my next vertex and click. When I want to commit this cut, I just hit enter. And now I have made the cut. And then I can come to the bottom here, K, left click, left click, enter, and it's cut. Now, if I didn't have the supporting edge loop here that I made, um, I can still cut all the way around. I just have to kind of eyeball it. So I can click here and I can hold shift if I want to snap to the center of an edge. Otherwise, I would probably go into um, like top view and try and line this up as best I can. And then I would go straight down. In fact, I'm going to kind of mess this up just so we can see how to fix it. Go straight down and then come back. Whoop. If you misclick, like if I accidentally cut like over here, you can just control Z. It'll go back one cut. And then I hit enter. So now we see the cut that I made is not perfectly straight. It's gross. So usually what I will do is I'll just go into whatever view one, three or seven. Um, is most appropriate, and I'll just slide. Whoa. Do I have some kind of snapping on? That was weird. I wonder why it's going back there. Uh, anyway, in this case, I'll just use X. I'll get it close, so I'll get all the vertices pretty close. And then again, like something in my brain, I need to know that these are all in the same spot. So easiest way to do that is if you select everything, and hit S. In this case, we want to scale on the X axis. So I can scale in the X axis to zero and it'll snap everything in, in line. So I'll exaggerate that. So if I leave this way out here and I grab everything, scale, X axis, zero, snaps everything kind of to the center. And then I could move this back over if I needed to. So that's usually how I line things up with a cut that isn't perfectly centered. So again, I'll, I'll show if I wanted to add a cut here instead of a loop cut for some reason, I just want to use the knife tool. I cut all the way around, I complete it. I hit enter, go into front mode. I see that it's all out of whack. I select all the vertices, I scale. In this case, I use the X axis and I hit zero. That kind of snaps them all to the center. It's not merging them, it's just snapping them. Now while we're here, speaking of merge, we can merge these. So if I wanted to merge this edge loop in the center into this edge loop because I don't need this here anymore, or whatever. I, again, I could just dissolve these edges and it, it's gone, but let's say I wanted to merge them. If you're very specific about the order you select things, you can do very specific things with your merge. So for example, if I select the thing, uh, this vert on the left first, and then I shift select the vert on the right, I can then click M for merge. And you can see that I have a bunch of options. I have at center, which will uh, merge them both to the midpoint between the two. I have a cursor, which will put them at the 3D cursor, which is horrifying. Collapse, which is essentially like center, but if we had more than two verts, uh, it would collapse to the center of those. And then we have at first and at last. So because I selected the one on the left first and the one on the right second, if I merge at first, you can see the one on the right goes left. If I merge at last, you can see the one on the left goes to the right. So if I do the same over here, I pick left and then right, M for merge at last. Boom, boom, at last, boom, boom, at last. What's nice about Blender is when you hit the same menu again, you can see 
menu moves itself so that my cursor is under the last thing I selected, which is nice and handy. So you don't have to move your mouse every time. I can just hit M and then left click because my cursor is already at my last selection, which comes in handy. Another handy one is merge by distance. This is essentially like remove doubles from, I think Maya's remove double. So if I had some verts that were like super close to one another and I'm like, why are these here? My geometry is all screwy or something's going wrong. I can hit A to select everything. I can hit M for merge and I could go merge by distance. And then if I expand my little helper window here, I can increase this slider to increase the distance that it will merge by. And if we look at the bottom center here, you can see right now it says removed zero vertices. So with this merge distance, I'm not actually removing anything, but as I increase this, you can see it now removed four vertices. I do this all the time. I look up here to see if there's a big visual difference. And if I remove any amount of verts without there being a big visual difference, then it's like, okay, cool. They must've been super close to each other. So I have essentially removed some doubles that were sitting like right on top of each other. Okay, uh, any questions on anything so far? Not at the moment. That, ver that merge stuff is super helpful. It's so nice when you're like just kind of flying through stuff. Um, just being able to really quickly merge uh, is very, very helpful. Okay. I just like um, to do all these different modifiers on top of each other before you actually commit to any of them. Oh yeah, modifiers are great. Totally. Um, okay, so uh, they have one question. What? I'm, what? What? Sorry, I have one question. Yeah, I wanted to know how long it took you once you started using Blender before it became your program of choice. We're talking like months, years, or it's like I'm not using anything uh, else. I'm just using this. If we're talking about like condensed time, I think I would say probably 20 to 30 hours straight up, but that 20 to 30 hours was over the course of like three years. Gotcha. So I would just, I would be like blender. Okay, fine. I'm doing it. And then I would get in there and I would start to model and I would be like, okay, I, I would it, basically anytime I would do something that was irreversible or like broke the interface that I couldn't like figure out how to recover from, I'd be like, okay, I'm uninstalling. I don't need this. Um, <laughs> but then as I, as I learned those things, I was like, okay, now that I know how to fix stuff, now that I know how to not ruin everything in a matter of seconds, um, then it got better. And then, um, I think it helped too that Blender was getting more and more popular, especially with the release of 2.8, where they kind of read like all this UI interface and all this stuff. None of this stuff was like here before. Um, it, it was a terrifying place to be. Mm -hmm. So, uh, this is um, get out of here, you bot. Sorry, there's a bot. Oh, is that what that was? Uh, yeah. So this this is in a much better state uh, than it was when I started learning. So that definitely helps. Like as soon as this rolled over, I was like, okay, cool, I got this. No, no problem. So what you're saying is Blender is like Brussels sprouts. People like it more now because they're actually better. <laughs> yeah. Once people learned you could air fry Brussels sprouts and like dip them in truffle dip or whatever, then it's like, yeah, oh, okay, we can do this. Truffle dip? What circles are you running Oh, in, but Bryce? I know what Cordelia is saying with them actually like just genuinely being a slightly different version of the plant than they used to be that are less bitter. Oh, like, so that, I get Like that they've too. been bred yeah, to they, taste better. Yeah. Like in the last like 20 years or so, like within the last 20 years, they, they actually taste like completely different from the old ones. So it's not just people getting better at using them. It's also, it's just, they're just better. So same with Blender. Kind of like bananas, <laughs> yeah. how old bananas used to be a certain way. Mm -hmm. And then like, it's a new species of banana that we're eating now, basically. Oh. That's why banana flavored things taste like a different type of banana than the banana we're used to. Because it's an entirely different version of the plant banana the and watermelon flavored anything never tastes like the actual fruit ever i mean no. same with a lot though like grape flavor you can't tell me that grape flavored anything tastes like what an actual grape yeah. tastes like it just doesn't oh, actually so it's, 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 it's grapes that are available to us aren't the same ones 
Yeah, yeah. It's the same as the banana because there is a kind of grape that tasted like that, but we don't use those commonly anymore. Yeah, I, guess yeah, I found a couple. I think, well, <laughs> one of the times uh, when we were in Japan, we got like an actual grape and it was round and purple and it mm -hmm. was delicious. And I was like, oh, this is a grape. Versus <laughs> uh, they're wine grapes, I think. They're a different, they have thicker, right. little thicker skins. I yeah, think they're, was, they make wine out of. It was so good. Yeah, I almost that works. Yeah, I guess we can't expect every plant that we eat to be the exact same variety as <laughs> the ones we're used to. Yeah, I wonder if there's there's like universal flavorings, but like local fruit. So like everyone agreed that this was grape at some point, but then like we're eating, you know, green grapes from Meyer, and that just is not the same as the grapes they base the flavor on. How, how mm -hmm. did we get here? I like how, yeah, I like how we can somehow end up talking about just these cool random topics. <laughs> Like that was my fault with the Brussels sprouts. Sorry. Yeah, it was. It was an analogy. Uh, no, 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 no. I apologize. It's funny. Great bottled. So now we just go ahead and model a Brussels sprout. Right there here. you go. Let's do it. Yeah. Well, speaking you ever of that. Have seen how they grow? Steve says cool. mass produced versus select fruits and veggies. Oh yeah, and all the chemicals and. All yeah. The and when they de decipher the formula for a specific flavor, they're not going to make like five other flavors for the five other varieties. Yeah. Just in case. Good. Fun, fun, random fact before we get back to uh, back to Blender. Did you know that apples naturally have wax on them, like from the what? as a protective coating, and yeah, like we get ones yeah. that have have the wax washed off of them <laughs> and then re-added it. Because I saw this thing that was like a recipe, is a part of the recipe called for scraping off the wax of the apple, and I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, random yep. things. Continue with the Blender. Good old apple wax. I know. This will be the topic of Alyssa's stream. We're just going to talk about food. There you go. Apple wax. That's, that's very <laughs> accurate to my personality. <laughs> um, so let's do visual stuff now. Because modeling is modeling. We all know how to model. But let's make this stuff look good. Yes, I totally know how to model. Yeah. yeah. We know now. Mm -hmm. Uh, So... One good exercise, uh, if it is like you play around with modifiers and do stuff, and then try and get it back to a previous state manually. So, for example, I'm going to put this back to a cube because it's good practice to learn how to undo stuff. So, super quick, I can just alt select this edge loop, dissolve the edges, alt select this edge loop, dissolve the edges. Boom, dissolve. I'm back to somewhat of a cube. If I come into top mode, I can see that this vertex is not exactly where it needs to be, so I can move this up. I'm gonna move it up pretty close, then I'm gonna select all these, and I'm gonna scale in the Y, and I'm gonna hit zero to make sure they're absolutely perfectly straight, which they are now. I'm gonna do the same thing with this side. Scale in the X, hit zero, make sure they're perfectly straight. They're all good. Then I can delete my subdivision modifier, and I can delete my mirror modifier. And look at that. Back to a cube. Now, uh, this face is open, so I'm going to select these verts. And I'm going to hit F to fill. And then I'm going to come in here. And I'm going to move that face back out halfway. Or, what I could do is I could leave the mirror modifier. I go back to here. I could have just put the mirror modifier back, I suppose, but whatever. We'll do this again. Boom, 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 boom. I could leave the mirror modifier and then I could just apply it in object mode. So if I'm in object mode, I can click this and I can click apply. And now it's one solid cube. And then I can select like uh, the center edge loop uh, and I can dissolve that as well if I wanted to. Now, the reason this looks a little bit janky is because Shade Smooth is still on. So if I go to Shade Flat, it goes back to my original view. I have a quick question that is not related to the exact thing you're talking about. Sure. But you said that edge loops, like you just had to use the scrolly wheel to like get more than one edge loop, but I haven't been able to do that. Um, it's just oh. turning the, it's only giving me one option. So I was just wondering. Yeah, so when you control R before you click anything, if you scroll, 
It should let oh, you. Oh, wait. No. But if you if you click the bar on the left, I noticed it didn't it doesn't let you do that. It only does it if you use the hot key. Oh yeah. Yeah, you you yeah. You got to control oh. R. Yeah, I had to click away from it and then click back into it with the control R. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yes, no problem. Um I rarely ever use these on the side. Um they're good because sometimes they offer you different options uh, or different combinations of stuff. Um, but yeah, sometimes they can they can be different for some reason. Uh, cool. Now that I'm back to a cube, we can talk about some visual stuff like UV unwrapping because that's important. But before we want to unwrap it, we want to actually be able to see if we're unwrapping it correctly. So we need to be able to kind of see like a checker pattern at least. Um, and to get a nice checker pattern, we need to uh, apply a material. And in order to see that material, um, we should probably have some kind of lighting uh, or something in the scene. So it's a perfect time to go over our windows on the side here. So in the upper right, uh, we have the um, outliner and then in the middle bottom right, we have uh, the properties. So the outliner is just like any of this, just like the hierarchy in Unity or the world outliner in uh, Unreal or whatever that menu is called in Maya, I forget. In this, we have scene collection, which is essentially everything in the scene. We have kind of sub collections or just general collections um, which are just groupings of objects they're not parented to each other they're not like tied to each other in the actual scene the collection is just simply like a folder um, which is nice you can double click on these to rename them so I could call this like geo and then I could right click and create a new collection called like lighting and that's where I could put all my lights you can collapse these which is nice Now on the right, we have some visibility options. So collections, you can toggle on and off. So exclude from view layer basically just means turn this completely off. We have the eyeball, which just hides. And then we have the render, which excludes it from the render. So again, I could hide the cube, but when I render, the cube will show back up because I haven't turned off the render enabled button. Now there are two other buttons on this side that should be default but aren't don't know why they're not and that's uh selectable and um like active i guess is i forget what it's actually called so if we click this little filters drop down uh, at the top there's these toggles so i usually toggle on the selectable toggle and i usually toggle on the uh, disable in viewports the reason I do this is uh, a lot of times with an image ref or something like that, like an image plane, I like to turn off the selection. So since I did that on the cube now, you can see I can't actually select the cube. I can't click on it, I can't move it. So whenever I have like an image plane, I usually turn that off so I don't accidentally grab it. The disable in viewports is better than the eyeball because it actually deactivates the object. It doesn't just hide it. Um, you know, like in Unity, like even if you hide an object, it's still like there, like its components are still there. Its components are still enabled and stuff like that. Um, I guess you could kind of equate this to like, this is just like toggling the game object, but this is like disabling all of the components. Or it's so, like the match render versus the game object. Yeah. So like this is more performant. If I turn this off, Blender is like actively disabling this thing. If I just hide it, Blender's still thinking about it. It's still in the back of its mind. So this does almost nothing for performance, whereas this is really good for performance. So that's why I like to have those two extras enabled, just in general. You can select stuff in the hierarchy um, just by left clicking on it. Anytime you have like an eyedropper thing, um, like we saw with the mirror modifier, 
um, you can not only select like just objects in the world, um, but you can just select directly from the hierarchy as well. So sometimes that's handy instead of having to like, if you have like a thousand objects trying to find like the right one or like trying to select like something that's very wiry, you can just go up to the hierarchy and click uh, and it'll pick that instead. <coughs> now in this case, it didn't work because a cube can't reference its, well, this object can't reference itself as the mirror because it's already doing that. So like, why would you do that? That's pretty much it uh, for the hierarchy up here or the outliner, I should say. Fairly straightforward outliner stuff. You can drag stuff around, move it. Used to not be this easy. You kids don't know how good you have it. You kids. <laughs> you kids. Um, but so sure the, the oldest person on this call. No, no, no. <clears throat> uh, so the properties, uh, the just going through these really quick. Some of them you'll use all the time. Some of them you'll never touch. This is the like active tool. So right now I have select box. So we could mess with this and change like how it selects things uh if we had the transform tool we could change um different orientations and things like that um i almost never use this unless i'm doing like vertex painting or weight painting um it's handy for weight painting because a lot of the brush tools uh, are over here but for normal modeling there's really nothing too special here scene this is a big one this is where a lot of our good looking stuff's gonna come from so I'm going to put our viewport into um, material preview mode, which we can either access uh, by hitting Z and going to material preview or coming up to our render options and clicking the third to the right. And that just makes it so that we can kind of see what the actual like environment and lighting and stuff looks like. So material preview um, is using simulated uh, a simulated world and lights. So if we click the little drop down here, um, you can see that we can select different HDRIs. We can rotate them. We can make them stronger. If we want to actually be able to see them, we can increase the world opacity. So like if I put this to like this interior, there it is. Turn the blur down and you can see like this is just straight up harsh. I hate that. So I'm going to blur it a little bit. And I'm going to turn the opacity way the, almost all the way down. I'll leave it a little bit just so we have something interesting to look at. Put the blur back to 0.5 and I'll put the strength back to 1 and I'll put the rotation back to 0. Okay. So this is just kind of giving us some nice general lighting and rendering stuff so in our scene tab render engine i almost always use eevee uh cycles is the older one um cycles is more of your traditional renderer um where it has to re-render every time you do anything anytime you move or, or change it'll re-render the frame um it's cycles is more i guess technically robust in terms of like quality because it's more of a traditional renderer um we're doing passes and bounce lighting and all that other kind of stuff, like uh, as it renders. Um, Eevee is real time, so Eevee is more of your engine rendering stuff. So I almost always leave it in Eevee because that's what this stuff always ends up in is like a game engine. So why not? Sampling, uh, I never really change. Um, the big ones are ambient occlusion and bloom. So just turning these on is nice. So uh, if I move this over here, uh, we can see some of the ambient occlusion effect. Sometimes I like to set the factor. This is It's the same thing uh, in here as it is on, in Unreal. Um, the maximum slider is just a suggestion. So this says 1, uh, but if I type, I can go higher. So if I go 50, I can see there's where my ambient occlusion is. So I usually do that. Then I adjust the distance to something that's kind of, you know, what I want. And then I dial this back down to like 1 or 5 or 2. We'll do five. And point one. I said point one. Bloom, same thing. We can change the threshold if we want it to be bloomier. I just leave that alone. Depth of field, I don't ever use uh, because the cameras have their own depth of field settings. So I don't see the point of using this one. Subsurface scattering, same. Um, screen space reflections, I always turn on. I don't really mess with anything in here. If we were doing like glass stuff, maybe uh, turn a refraction on, but 
it's neither here nor there. Motion blur, I leave off typically. Um, volumetrics are on by default, so that can stay as is. Performance, no. Hair, no. Shadows. If you want, you can turn on high bit depth, but I usually don't. Soft shadows are on by default. So most of this stuff is already like good to go. So usually I just check the boxes for ambient occlusion, bloom, uh, screen space, reflections. I come down to film every once in a while, or no, not film, sorry, uh, colored management um, every once in a while to set the uh, look to like high contrast or something, just because I like how that looks better. Simplify is nice if you're doing like a lot of intense stuff. Um, what Simplify will do, if I had um, a subdivision modifier on both of these things uh, and a bunch of other stuff, what Simplify essentially does uh, is it like disables um, certain things. So it sets like a hard cap for child particles, volume. Um, my max subdivision is set to six. So uh, if I set this to a low number like two uh, and I turn this off, and let's say my subdivision modifiers here are set to five for both of these. If I were to turn simplify on, it would set these max subdivisions back down to two. So this is like a global thing. So this is really nice if you have a bunch of different models with a bunch of different things going on and particles and all that stuff, you can just click simplify and then get a lot of performance back um, very quickly. So that's pretty much it for for that just when you want good looking stuff you just go through you check ambient occlusion bloom screen space um set your color management filmic high contrast whatever you want there um the defaults are pretty good to go we then have uh the output so this is where we can change the resolution and the frame range and where we're actually putting this if we're rendering an image or an image uh sequence or um, an ABI or an MPEG, uh, whatever we want to render, um, image or video is, is all here. Won't go into that too much because we don't really do a lot of rendering bits. View layer properties, I almost never touch. Um, this is just for um, like visualizing different, um, like you can look at like Z depth and, and things like that. Um, I never touch this stuff. Scene properties, same thing. Like, I usually don't do like particle simulation or anything like that, or physics, so like gravity units and stuff. I guess if you wanted to change like to Imperial, like you could, you could change the unit scale if you wanted to match it um, more to like something else. But uh, again, this one I don't usually touch. The world, the world uh, properties are. Um, if we were in render mode, we can see that this uses the scene lights and the scene world. So if we wanted to set an HDR for the background of our scene world, like a custom one, that's where this world properties um, can come in handy. So I don't know if I have one off the top. Um, I'm gonna go to Polyhaven really quickly and grab an HDR of whatever comes across my screen first. It's gonna be this Christmas photo studio. And I'm gonna download it in 2K because I don't wanna have to wait for it. So let's say I want this Christmas studio to be my background. Well, if we come to the world tab, you can see that our surface is set to background. And instead of color, I can change this to an environment texture. We could leave the color if I just wanted this to be like super bright, like a white void or something like that. We could. Please don't. Um, <laughs> bright enough for you. So instead, I'll switch this to an environment texture. Everything goes horrifying pink. That's, that's because there's no listen here. I it's because there's no texture. So <laughs> if I click open and I go to my downloads and I find the thing I just downloaded, there it is. Oh, I downloaded an EXR. Hang on, I want an HDR. Thank you. My eyes, they bleed. Yes. So I'm going to select the HDR. And there it is. Here's my HDR background. That is very cool. Again, I can make it super bright or super dark if I wanted to turn this down a little bit. Because it's an HDR, obviously, you know, there's some cool effects we get, like these lights. Um, 
can get all bloomy and uh, that one especially over there pretty intense leave that at one if I don't want to see uh, this um, the background but I still want to like have all its effects applied uh, we can go to uh, oh no I always forget where it is where is it Oh, uh, this isn't radio. Okay, here we go. Uh, blender, uh, background transparency. I always do it like once and then never do it again. Okay, it's under film, of course. Obviously, why wouldn't it be? So under film, we can check this transparent box and then we won't see the world, but it still is affecting our cube or our, our environment. Now, can you blur that background like you can with the like default ones? You can do a lot of stuff to this, but because this is more custom, you need to do that in the actual... There's a world shader that you can actually edit. Um, so in the shader editor, we can actually uh, pick like the world itself, uh, wherever that may be. <clears throat> but yeah, you, you can set it up in here so that you can actually have like a full on shader as your background and you can blur it and um, you could do like HSV stuff to it. You can do all kinds of stuff to it um, after that. I'm going to turn it back on though because I like seeing it. I'm just going to turn it down a little bit. There we go. So uh, blasting through the rest of these. This uh, is the object properties. So this just shows you its position in space, um, where you've moved it to. Relations, things like parenting and things like that. These are all just kind of visual um, or, or, or like you can check information of things here. I usually don't mess with this too much uh, unless it's to either lock or unlock some of these um, elements. Modifiers tab, which we've already seen. Particles, which I hardly ever use because um, they're just not useful uh, <clears throat> for me. But if you were to have particles, that's where they'd be. Same thing with this, uh, the physics stuff, physics properties um, for cloth and, and all that kind of simulation stuff. Again, don't really use that too much. Then we have constraints. Constraints are really fun. Same thing like in Maya. Um, like in, in Maya, if you've ever like done like rigging for like IK and pole targets and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, this is like those solvers, I think they're called in Maya. Um, so constraints are basically like solvers. For example, <clears throat> we'll do a quick setup for that. If I wanted to uh, have a light and I wanted the light to always be looking at this object, we can do that with a constraint. So if I hit shift A to add, and I go to light, I'm going to add an area light. And I'm going to move it up. And I'm going to move it over. So normally, this would be a real pain to like have to rotate this. If I move my cube somewhere else, then I have to come in here and I have to rotate and I have to position it. Not with constraints. So with my light selected, I can add a constraint. You can see we have a bunch here. Copy location, rotation scale, copy transforms, limits, all this kind of stuff. Track two is what we want when we want something to look at something else. So if I click track two, I can then select a target. I can click my little eyedropper and I can click on my cube in here or over here. And now we can see it's looking at my cube. And if I move my cube, it's following it. So what's nice about this is if I have something like this three-point lighting setup, these lights are all following this object because each of these lights has a track two constraint. So that's super handy. So constraints are great. I'm just going to scale these up. Might as well leave them here. 
the next one down is vertex uh properties or no object data properties technically um, but this is usually where uh, i mess with vertex and shape keys um there's a bunch of other stuff here uh sometimes i'll come in normals for auto smooth but mainly it's just vertex groups and shape keys if you don't see this it's because you might have an object selected that isn't a mesh so if i have my light selected you'll actually see that under constraints is light properties instead of vertex properties so if i select one of these lights and use the light tab i can mess with stuff regarding the light so for example all of these uh the power of all these lights is very low so if i click on this i can increase the power just by dragging my slider change the color so i can make that one blue make this one a little more red make this one a little more red why not we can also change the shape of them if we wanted to if we wanted to make these a disc for example we can change the size by making it bigger or smaller custom distance is something that you can use uh, so like if i had a floor here something like that let's say that i wanted this to not go as far like i just wanted this to hit the front surface but not like pass through all the way to the back like this uh, i could just lower a custom distance so that it just goes as far as i needed to so now you can see uh, if i increase the power of this one you can see with a longer distance it's casting a shadow but if i shorten the distance i can have a little bit of control over that shadow itself i don't usually mess with other than contact shadows i like to have contact shadows on for all of them um it just it gives you a more consistent look Now that we're talking a little bit about visual stuff, um, the scene is a little bit cluttered looking with all the lights and gizmos and crosshairs and stuff like that. So the quick way to kind of get rid of all this stuff uh, and just see what your scene actually looks like, if we go to the left of our render options, you can see the little like filled circle and hollow circle. This is show overlays. We can just click this to disable it. And now we're just looking at our scene in its pure form without any of the gizmos and stuff similar to in unity where you can show and hide if we had a gizmo uh, that's the button to the left of that show gizmos so we can toggle that on off as well or you can just go back to your selection uh, with W um, and there's no gizmo for the selection so it kind of goes away anyway And then lastly, in this little stack, well, not technically last because there is texture properties, but I never mess with those, um, is the little material ball, plastic material. Every object, when you create one, usually gets assigned a default material. In this case, it's just called material. And we have some exposed properties available to us. So base color, subsurface properties, metallic, specular, roughness, normals, alphas, all the stuff you'd expect. And we can just change these. So I could just make this aqua, teal, tealish. I could turn up the metallic. I could turn down the roughness. And now we have like a perfectly reflective object. Turn the roughness back up a little bit. Turn the metallic back down a little bit. If I wanted this to be transparent, you can see I'm adjusting the alpha, but nothing's really happening. It's because down here under the settings, just like the shader settings uh, in in like Unity or the, um, I think it's still called blend modes in Unreal. Um, Right now we're opaque. Uh, so instead, normally we would set to transparent or translucent or masked. Those are all unreal things. And then um, transparent in, in Unity. Uh, in this case, uh, alpha hashed is usually the way I go for both the blend and the shadow mode. Um, and now you can see we have transparency. 
The reason I do alpha hash is because sometimes alpha blend gets weird, like, draw issues where it's, like, not rendering certain things over other things. And so uh, hashed usually I find to be more consistent. Backface calling, if we want to not render backfaces, we can check that. And then you can see it's not rendering those. And we could also turn on refraction for fun. Turn up some of the refraction depth, maybe mess with the index of refraction. There's a whole bunch of stuff uh, that we can play around with there. I'm going to put those back to not transparent. Uh, emission's another fun one. We can just make it emit by increasing the emission strength. Now it's all glowy. Pretty standard stuff there. So the last thing that we were going to talk about was UVs. Uh, now that we have a way of visualizing all of that stuff, uh, UVs will take us through a nice quick tour of um, unwrapping and some shader manipulation. And then that should take us right to the end. So I have my cube and I want to unwrap it. First, what I like to do is I like to just make a material that's just a checker material. The way that you mess with materials in Blender, in this little window at the top of the material tab, we can see I have my material that's assigned here. I might call this like cube mat or something like that. On the right side, we have plus and minus. This does not add a material, this adds a material slot. So if I had something that needed to have more than one material, I could add a material slot. I could create a new material by clicking this new. I could call this cube mat two. This is white. I could select a face and I could click assign after selecting my cube mat two material. And now it has assigned that material to that face. If I want to get rid of that material, I can just click the minus. If I wanted to assign a different material to this, I can click this drop down and pick a different material. Or if I wanted to create a whole new material, I could just click the X and click new. Or I could duplicate the material by clicking the little new material copy button and that'll duplicate it as a separate one and I can rename to something else like more cube now there's something very important about this process that is somewhat unique to blender and can be extremely frustrating if you don't know about it so right now I have this more cube assigned if I click the little drop down here, you can see that cube mat two has a zero next to it. This zero means that it is not currently being used by anything in the file, like at all. So what will happen if I were to save this and I'll just save this to my desktop as test. If I were to close Blender and reopen this file and look at my drop down you can see my material's gone the the cube mat 2 that was white is gone so what blender does is if something is not assigned to an object or if it's not being used at all in the file it will just clear it it'll just Lead it. It'll just say, this isn't being used. Why would you need it? And it'll kill it. It'll go away forever. We can see it's about to happen to my cube mat next because my cube mat's not assigned anything. To prevent this, so if I make this red so that we can tell it's different. To prevent this, if I click the little shield button next to this asset, it will fake that it has something that is using it. So that's what fake user means. So if I click this, it's like telling Blender, hey, 
this is definitely assigned to something, I promise. So with this little shield selected, now I can select my other material. I can see that this now has an F instead of zero, so it's F for fake. So even though this red material is not being used anywhere, because I faked the user, now if I close and reopen this, we'll see that it's still here. So that's super important. Anytime you see a slot that has a little shield next to it, I always click the shield because I would much rather go back through uh, and deal with this on my own than lose stuff and not know where it went or why. So that's like a really weird blender thing um, that you just need to be aware of. So I always click the shield. So lie to the program. Yes. Be like, hey, blender. Trust me, there's definitely someone using this. And I like, I don't think there is. I think I want to delete this. And you're like, no. <laughs> there. Gaslight blender. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so That's I want to make a. Using it. <laughs> yeah, trick it. So I want to make a new material here. I want to make a checker material. So what I'll do is I'll just unlink that. Just click the little X. It doesn't delete the material, it just removes it from this object. And I'll just click new, and I'll call this checker. <coughs> now you could come down here to base color and click the little um, the little dot and set this to like a checker texture and all that stuff, but it gets really obnoxious to do a lot of that stuff in this window. It's much better to just go to the actual shader editor because it's a much more traditional approach. So I'm gonna come to the upper right corner and click and drag to give myself a new window. And in the upper left corner, I'm gonna click for the mode and I'm gonna put this to shader editor. And this brings us to a pretty standard node-based shader editor. So this principled BSDF is using the same, it's, it's the same thing. Like what we see here is this so if i were to change this to red you can see it changes to red here as well but like i said this is a much more traditional way to 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 do stuff it's just a lot easier so i want to add a checker texture to my base color so um to add things just like in our viewport if we just hit shift a it'll bring up the add menu and if i search just by left clicking uh, i can search for checker texture if I hit enter it'll select the node and then I just have to left click to place it same thing as in the regular viewport if I right click it'll cancel that so it's kind of the same controls so if I left click there it is so now I can plug the color of this into the base color and I can see my checker Now, another important thing to do, because, um, well, I might, maybe I'll just demonstrate this. So we'll, we'll leave that as is for now. So let's unwrap this cube. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch this shader viewport over to UV editor viewport. And right now we don't see any UVs at all. And that's because we're not in edit mode, we're in object mode. So in order to see the UVs, we want to make sure we are in edit mode. And your UVs will show up based on what you have selected in your viewport. So if I don't have anything selected in my viewport, and no vertices, no faces, no nothing, nothing will show up. If I hit A to select all, we'll see everything. So simplest way to do this is just to hit the U key, U for unwrap, in the viewport. That'll bring up the UV mapping menu. And I can hit unwrap, smart UV project, follow active quads, cube projection, cylinder sphere, standard stuff. Project from view. We can also mark and clear seams. If I were to just do a regular unwrap right now, nothing would happen uh and if we look as to why down here there's a little warning message it says failed to solve one of one uh 
edge seams may need to be added. It's because I have no seams, so it doesn't know where to split. It doesn't know what to rip in half or whatever. If I want it to do it for me, I can do the smart UV project. When I click on that, I can set some settings like angle limits and things like that. This is pretty standard auto unwrap stuff. I always like to give an island margin of at least like 0 0.1. 0 0.1 might be a little big actually. So now if I hit okay, look at that. It did it. So it just followed these, split them up. Anything that was uh, below um, this angle limit got split into its own UV island. Which, eh, sometimes not great. But sometimes you just don't care. <laughs> Especially if you're going to do texture painting or something like that. Uh, or if this just needs to be like a tileable texture. Um, sometimes it's just like, fine, just do a smart UV project, auto unwrap. Who cares? Get rid of it. It's done. Quick time if check. Rather, to do more... Sorry, quick time check. Rather hour and a half now. Oh, yeah, I know this. Oh, he right. is the most fun part. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so if we wanted to do more standard UV stuff, um, let's say I wanted to split. So I'm just going to quickly select everything that I would normally seam. So if I cut these, uh, actually, I'll just do edge mode. So if I select like these three edges here and I hit U, I can go to mark seam and now they turn red. So those are a seam. I can select these three again, hit U, mark seam. And then maybe I'll cut a seam along the bottom here. Now, if I do this, the standard unwrap, you can see it's a more traditional cross pattern because I've added seams and I've unwrapped it. Now, something of note here, if I go into my UV editor and I grab these and move them around or scale them, you can see my checkerboard is not updating at all. And the reason why is because we didn't tell our shader to use the UVs of the object. So if I go back into shader editor, this checker texture wants an input for vector. So again, this is kind of standard shader stuff. We need a texture coordinate. So the texture coordinate, if I plug the UVs into the vector, now, and I'll split this window so that we can see both. Now, when I go into my UV editor and I select all these and I scale them, you can see it's actually updating. So I'm gonna change the scale of my checker texture to be a little bit higher so we can see it. Okay, so general setup was we selected our object, we cleared the material and created a new one called checker. We opened up the shader editor, added a checker texture in the base color, added a texture coordinate with the UV plugged into the vector. We then tabbed into edit mode. We selected some edges and hit U to mark them as seams. Then we selected everything, hit U and unwrapped. And now we can edit our UVs as needed. I won't get into like all the stitching and the movement and the all that other stuff that's fairly standard stuff, um, a little more specific to um, like the UV unwrapping process and things like that. Um, but what I will leave us with is one uh, last potential pitfall for this UV unwrapping. So I'm going to delete this object. I'm going to create a cube. I am going to scale this cube in the X axis. I am going to scale it in the Y slightly in object mode. Now I'm going to tab into edit mode. I'm going to apply this checker texture and I'm going to unwrap it. I'll do a smart UV project. Why not? There we go. Now you can see that it unwrapped in all squares but my object is not square it's it's rectangular well we don't want to get into geometry of squares and rectangles but uh it, it's stretched <laughs> it's stretched and that's a problem so when you do a transform to 
in object, in object mode, especially a scale, you want to apply that transform before you go into your UV editing. In order to do that, we hit Control A. So in this case, I'll just apply all transforms because might as well. When I apply all transforms, and then I come back in and I do my smart UV project, you can see now it actually adheres to the bounds of my actual object. Now I'm going to undo so that we can see a different visualization of that. If I hit N on my keyboard, and I go over to uh, Item, and I'm in object mode and I select my cube. You can see that my scale here is set to four in the X, 0.8 in the Y and one in the Z. When I hit control A and apply all transforms, you can see these go to one. So that's exactly like freeze transform in Maya. So now that these are all one, Blender is no longer compensating for additional stretch and things like that. So when we unwrap this, it's like, okay, cool. I understand the dimensions now. Whereas when we didn't apply that because there were transforms applied to this object, Blender was trying to compensate for that or, or just straight up ignoring those transforms and just unwrapping the one, one, one um, square instead of the, the new one, one, one. So that's essentially what apply is doing. If I were to rotate this, you can see I have a rotation values here now. If I were to apply rotation or all transforms, you can see these all go back to zero again. So this is now like setting, this is its like base position or its base rotation or its base scale. That's very important for rigging as well. So next week when we get into rigging, it's very, very important that you apply transforms before you start rigging something um, because I don't think you can do it afterwards because it's such a hard commit thing um everything all the bones and and ik and all that stuff is like all based around maybe not the ik but but it, a, a lot of the rigging is based around um these transform properties so if you don't apply beforehand it can get a little obnoxious later on okay uh does anybody have any questions on anything that we did today <laughs> i should have probably asked that more often throughout i apologize I don't have any questions because I wanted to watch you do it first and then go back and rewatch you do it while following along because I feel like that just works well for me. Um, are we, this is probably way late to ask this question, but this is recorded, right? Or It's on our Twitch you? channel and I save all these. So you just go back to the channel. I just wanted saved. to make sure um, <clears throat> because, yeah, I feel like you've covered a lot of cool stuff and being able to just watch you do it the first time around and get familiar with all the menus and then actually go in and try to light my model and uv it and stuff after the yeah. last one i'm gonna flip all these for youtube i just want all three done before i did that um so a couple of weeks to be on our youtube channel too but yes i save every single stream we do every and every single one's been done since i've been hired so all the game nights too Alyssa. all the shenanigans they're all, they're all <laughs> nice yeah i've seen a couple hurt. of them i just wasn't sure if it was select ones or if it was all of them so that's no nope, I, I just delete the ones where we had like major tech issues like stream crashes and stuff i don't keep those but everything else I keep. I'm, I'm a hoarder. <laughs> Our Twitch channel is going to be like Bryce's Closet. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be great. Bryce is nice. I do have one question. Is there a way to, in the UVs to select like a continuous surface? Um, oh, L. Let's put oh, L. Okay. Let me check. That isn't phonetic. You say continuous surface and you use the letter L. Like normally like K has been knife and G has been grab. Yeah. And right, merge. L is for let me get them selections. <laughs> uh you don't have to click anything either, so I can just hit L without clicking. What? Oh, and just be like moused over the general area. Yes. We... It's added. So if you click, yeah. it'll deselect and then you can like select something else if you wanted to, yeah. Wild. Okay, cool. There's also, so um, sometimes you might want to play with this little um, UV sync button, this little, these little arrows. Mm -hmm. So if, if you click this, then it will leave all of this on, even if you don't have it selected in the viewport. Sometimes it's handy. Now you'll see this UV sync actually not, it, it, you can't just move one 
thing independently anymore. So if like I'm in vertex mode and I click this corner, if I'm not in UV sync, I can like select this whole face and just move it completely independent. But if I'm synced and I try and move this face, you can see it's going to move all the things that it's connected to as well. I was wondering about Sometimes that because the good. edges weren't selecting the other the yes. connected edges. Okay, Sometimes so you want that. Sometimes you don't. Yeah. Okay, awesome. So sometimes I just toggle that on and off depending on what I need. And is and is there an edge split or does it only work through faces? Because the split didn't work. Like if you select an edge and try and cut it, basically, like the Maya cut didn't work. But I guess, but if you select a group of faces and do the split, that worked. So is there, is it just that it doesn't really work like the edge cut thing? Yeah, it's, it's a separate thing. I okay. usually, I'll usually cut Geo. Um, for all cut a UV, but that's just me. Um, so I haven't usually had to do that too often. Or I mean, like, um, to separate, like, to split it off at an edge uh, for a UV panel. Like, for more, for... But yeah, oh, it looks um, like... Yeah, so what I, so, like, what you're saying is, like, if I wanted this, like, if these two were, like, welded together and I wanted mm -hmm. to split them, um, mm -hmm. What you can do in non-sync mode, um, you can actually just select the face, uh, like a single face, and just hit U and unwrap that, and then it'll just become its own unique island. Yeah, I was just wondering, like, if you have, like, like, for example, um, I'm trying to think of what is a good example, just like to, I guess the making this, or I guess that's making the seams, and you do that in the other side, like to make a new seam somewhere, and to split that. Yeah. So like if if I mark these as seams and then unwrap this normally, oh gross, mm -hmm. uh, forgot to do one more. There we go. Yeah. Like say you do that, and then you just want to take that one edge on the right like that one panel on the right and make it its own thing like this one you do it from the face but can you select an edge like an edge seam and make that split uh i don't know okay yeah. well that's i mean i can dig into that i just wasn't sure if there was a quick method the problem it. is it's um when you're in so if you're in like sync mode it's gonna move all of them anyway Mm -hmm. Um, so usually I'll select what I want in sync mode and then I'll turn it off so that I just have this selected, but now this like is automatically split. So I can move that here and then go back into sync mode and see it's, it's automatically taken it apart. Mm -hmm. So okay. I could do that like here, like I could select these, get out of sync mode, then move this somewhere else, then back in sync mode, you could see it's essentially cut that out. Interesting. Okay. It's weird. Yeah. UVing is very weird in Blender. It's not my favorite thing ever. <laughs> there are certain things that I've just come to love, uh, like auto packing islands and all that kind of stuff. And, and especially, I don't even know if Maya had this for the longest time, but in, in Max, one of the greatest things is being able to um, pin islands. So you could select groups of stuff and, and group them together and pin them so that you could do auto operations and have certain things not be affected by those auto operations which is really nice. But yeah. Um, there is a... I'll have to find the link for it. Um, let me see. I'm going to stop streaming for a second while I dig. Just to see. Someone made... So uh, there was a, a classic a few years ago. Someone made a... Um, uh, Watching Zelda Cordelia rig Cordelia, what are for you doing? Maya for practicing. Um, and since then, they have ported it to Blender, uh, which is really cool. Oh, there it is. <coughs> okay, cool. Uh, let me pull the screen back. Sorry. I was like, yeah, just let me know when you're back up. I'm just watching Cordelia's screen just so there was something. Yeah, my bad. No, I'm, yeah. I'm back up. Um, right. So it's, it's this like Breath of the Wild 2 Zelda model that someone just put out here. <gasps> um, so for anybody that wants to get a uh. jump on moving around an animated or sorry a, a rigged model oh. um i can find this i think it's a gumroad thing and you can just download it for free or for however much you want to give them 
with fun with super advanced rigs. <laughs> yeah, and it is. It's an advanced one. But if you just want to get familiar with like how to move, uh, move and rotate stuff, um, you know, with without having to worry about like rigging a whole thing, uh, and then doing it uh, ahead of next week, you can. Steve says so they updated it with weapons. Sick. Yes, that is. May cannot get here fast enough. Oh my gosh, I know. There's a really good Samus model too, Steve. Oh, you want to see this? The really good Samus model, do you, Steve? Uh, oh, we haven't talked about Metroid VR in a while, and, and uh, I know that's on purpose because we're so close <laughs> to some Grocket stuff. Uh, so yeah, so there goes there goes Zelda. When I find that link, I'll give it up to to <gasps> someone. Oh. <laughs> Samus is looking a little lacking in textures. <laughs> well, <it's> fine. <laughs> yeah. Samus yeah. though. Where Samus's textures were packed. Uh let's just see if we can find them. Hey, that looks better. What? So yeah, so there's what? also a free Samus from Metroid Dread uh, model that is also uh rigged. Nice. You can grab uh, arms and I think I already have some poses. Yeah. Okay. That's right. Uh, Steve from the chat, yeah. Steve, um, and and I were playing around with uh, some animations on Samus. Steve has some really good animations on Samus as well. Steve says someday I'll finish that Samus animation too. Um, yeah. Yep. You will. But yeah. So uh, that's that. So that was like a little sneak peek. Next week, we're going to be doing very, very... We're not going to be doing this level of rigging, um, but we're going to do very simple rigging so that we can see part of the process uh, and then get into animating. Um, and animating will probably be more of the focus of that next stream so that you can uh, play around with these models and, and know how to add keyframes and what actions are, because actions are amazing, um, and and all that fun animative stuff. Um yeah. Oh. We can't just use Samus as like the base. We can't. We can't just. I mean, mate. Well, we'll do. We'll rig a. We'll rig like a couple boxes together, <laughs> uh, and get them moving, and then we'll just transition over to. Maybe Spread maybe it. Zelda. Zelda's more of a traditional rig. Right. Um. So. I was say you're just gonna rest to the owl. It. <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, Steve says, "Why? Well, thank you, sir." Oh yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, but that's nice to nice to be able to like rest of the out. So like for example, we have uh, like all these um, Ready Player Me avatars uh, that we were able to just download and just because we know enough about it. There's just a rig button where mm -hmm. you can just create a rig, uh, which we did, and then from that we could just animate individual elements. Uh, as like tweaks, uh, but then we can put this right into whatever we need to. Huh. I recognize that. <laughs> yeah. I will not say name and project. I don't want to get fired, yeah. but I recognize that. Yeah. <laughs> I managed to point out that character is in a wheelchair, so animating the legs probably isn't the thing. What? Why are you snapping the neck? Well, it's not right now. Oh, okay. Mike, it's not me. It's a facsimile of me. Uh, one, it has hair, <laughs> and mine retreated from my hair, my forehead, a long time ago until I finally started shaving it. Um, so like Bryce said, uh, next week will be the last of this series before we go into some space dragon update stuff. Um, and that'll be the first two weeks or. That'll be the 9th and the 16th of February. Excuse me. Next week's the 2nd, so I can't say that. 